all, we are delighted to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Zayana at the Oman Society of Nephrology Zoom meeting today. Dr. Zayana is a consultant nephrologist in Sultan Qaboos University Hostel. We are eager to hear from you, Dr. Zayana, the advancement in the understanding and treatment of taxiphylaxis. You can start now, Dr. Zayana. Welcome again. We are going to start with a patient, 54 years old male, who presents with diabetes and the old complication of diabetes, which is diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Also, he is complaining of hypertension, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, ischemic heart disease on medical treatment, peripheral vascular disease uh, with chronic dry gangrene in his left foot, end stage kidney disease on regular hemodialysis, secondary to diabetic nephropathy. The patient presented to the Sultan Qaboos University Hospital in March 2022 with uremic symptom, started dialysis through permicase. The patient started complaining from severe pain at the benign area. It started by erythema, edema, tenderness at the glands of the, his penis. Then it started to change to dusky coloration, superficial ulceration, then necrotic plaque, and differential diagnosis that you want to rule out in such the two two main differential diagnosis that you really need to uh, to exclude here is is this uh, like a porny gangrene that uh, developed really rapidly or this is an ischemic ulcer so he was hemodynamically stable he uh, had a, a, a swab culture from the ulcer that was positive for klebsella and morganella the uh, infectious disease team was involved. They started him on tazosin and clindamycin for that uh, worry about foreign gangrene. But as I said, hemodynamically stable, blood curses were negative. He was also screened for uh, sexually transmitted diseases and uh, like chlamydia, gonorrhea, and viral screen were all negative. He had ultrasound that showed no connection. So maybe the, the, main, the main diagnosis uh, workup for diagnosis were shifted into the second category, which is a vascular. Uh, event or ischemic ulceration. So the urology team and the vascular team got involved. And they proceeded into to, uh, a CT angiogram. And I'm not sure if I captured the best image, but I can, I can convince you here there is diffuse calcification of his bilateral internal arteries. There's also calcification in the external and femoral artery. You can also see there was diffuse calcification in the gonadal artery, maybe some calcification in the uh, in the uh, soft tissue as well, in the uh, proximal venous, and as well as the, uh, cal uh, the calcification along the benign artery. So given um, that he is a typical patient and a typical lesion, a diagnosis of calciphylaxis was made. So now I will talk about calciphylaxis and I will come back to the patient and what, has, what happened to him later on. So calciphylaxis is a cutaneous ischemic infarct caused by occlusion of the small blood vessels in the subcutaneous fat and dermis. Very debilitating disease, mortality rate can reach up to 80% in a year. The name is misleading because if you hear this word for the first time, you would think someone who had anaphylaxis to calcium, for example. But the word really calcium came from calcification, and phylaxis is to protect or protection. This was first time described by Dr. Hans Silai, who what he, he did, basically, he tortured a rat. He had a rat who he uh, injected him with calcium, uh, recombinant BTH, phosphate, iron injection. And then a week later, he noticed that this rat formed a, a shield of calcium around itself. So he thought this rat is trying to protect itself. So he came up with the name calciphylaxis. But typically, really, we see these uh, lesions in um, the stage kidney disease patients, either under dialyzed or not on dialysis yet. Um, and that's why the name was linked to, uh, as usual, to uremic toxins. So the name calcific uremic arteriopathy came up. But now we know that calciphylaxis actually can happen at any stage. It actually can happen in early stage of chronic kidney disease. It can happen in acute kidney injury in someone with a prior transplant and even in rare cases in someone with normal kidney function. So even this name, calcific uremic arteriopathy, is misleading and shouldn't be really used because we know that urea it shouldn't be named here. In fact, up till 2016, there was up to 116 cases reported in literature of, of either normal kidney function or an EGFR of at, at least 30. So I don't know what happened after 2016 because the cases are very scattered. 
So once you diagnose someone with calciphylaxis, the prognosis is really poor. Survival is less than one year. This is worse than a cancer. Cancer survive for years and they are under remission. But these patients really had really short lifespan. In fact, the mortality rate is three times that of patients uh, on dialysis without calciphylaxis. And uh, there's some studies that show patients on dialysis have a, 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 a lifespan of only five years after, after stopping dialysis if they didn't get transplanted. So imagine that that risk is multiplied by three. The prevalence is up to 4% in hemodia chronic hemodialysis patients. But the incidence is increasing. Why? Is because of maybe some lectures so people are if you so people are talking more about it if you if you hear more about it you think more of it and then you will diagnose more of it and hopefully this is the aim of this lecture is that you think about it and you see typical lesion in a typical patient so the classic presentation is a painful skin lesion and really the lesion can be anything so it could look like a babule a nodule or an induration a libido reticularis look like or an ecchymosis an ulcer a cancer like a gangrene like so really the lesion the look of the lesion might not be that helpful because the presentation can vary but maybe what's helpful is the characteristics of pain the pain is somatic is really very out of proportion of the skin lesion in fact it can precede the skin lesion like what happened to this patient who was having pain and then the lesion started but once you start to see this dusky discoloration of the skin it means that the skin necrosis or, or tissue necrosis already started and it will quickly turn into an ulcer and black scar. The main cause of death in these patients are sepsis, infected wound and uh, recurrent infections. But they also suffer from ongoing pain, anorexia, insomnia, depression, very poor quality of life. In very rare occasion, you might see uh, calcification in a non-vascular bed or like a skeletal myopathy or even visceral uh, lesions, very rare, but I will show you later on a case report of such. Uh, presentation. So the differential diagnosis is wide when you see the such lesion. So you can think of it as cellulitis or for induced necrosis, pyoderma gangliosum, necrotizing fasciitis. But as far as you keep this diagnosis in your mind when you see such patients, I think you will detect uh, more of these patients. So let's talk about the fact of pathophysiology. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Um, so this is the normal blood vessel. We have the adventitia, media, and the um, intima, and then the lumen. So the problem starts always in the media. The calcification, the precipitation of calcium starts in the media. And this will promote in intimal hypertro hypertrophy and hyperplasia. And with time, there will be uh, ongoing narrowing of the blood vessel. And just if you have any, uh, any trigger, any thrombotic trigger, pro-inflammatory trigger, autoimmune infection, or even continuous uh, uh, narrowing will lead to an acute vascular blockage of that in the arteries that supply a fat or uh, an epidermis. This this uh, figure from from uh, the paper the sources actually in the in the bottom. Uh, basically, I will come back to the risk factors, but just to say here that there are factors that promote calcification, but we also have factors that inhibit vascular calcification. Examples of that is carboxylated matrix GLA protein, putein, and biophosphate. This is a carboxylated matrix GLA protein is an important one. And in order to activate it, so it's uh, converting it from the uncarboxylated to the carbo carboxylated form, you need vitamin K. So in an indirect way, vitamin K is an important inhibitor of vascular calcification. Unfortunately, we are contributing into vitamin K deficiency in our patient in multiple ways. One of them is the use of warfarin. For the longest time, we thought warfarin is the only anticoagulation that we can use for vascular uh, for, for our dialysis patients. But vitamin K, as you know, warfarin, as you know, is a vitamin K inhibitor. So we are contributing to the process. Also, remember that we also give lots of strict dietary advices to these patients. So most of them, we have to, we have to advise them for low potassium, low phosphate, low calcium, low uh, salt, uh, they're diabetic, low sugar. So we give them really strict diets, but you can, we don't even think about other nutrition that we are actually uh, denying them from, including vitamin K. I remember that our dialysis filter itself does not only filter toxins and uremic toxin, it also filters micronutrients. And that's why there are some recommendations of providing these patients with vitamin supplements because we actually dialyze the five vitamins. So just to remember that we might be contributing to this process in an indirect way. 
this is a nice diagram from the New England Journal of Medicine. Basically, it talks about the same thing, so I'm going to skip it um, for the sake of time. And from the same paper, these are the risk factors for calciphylaxis. The main one is being in this stage kidney disease. A typical patient is a dialysis patient, female, obese, diabetic. Uh, other important risk factors being hypercalcemic, hyperphosphatemia, hyperparathyroidism, but also over suppressed BTH, which can lead to a dynamic bone disease in a very uh, in not very straightforward uh, mechanism, it can also create precipitate calciphylaxis. As I said, vitamin K deficiency. And then we have a long list of uh, pro inflammatory conditions, whether they are cancer or autoimmune or infectious uh, diseases, that triggers or maybe it gives that last trigger, which lead to the end thrombosis of, of that uh, small capillaries or in, uh, arteries. In fact, during the COVID era, there was few case reports of COVID-induced uh, uh, calciphylaxis because of the poor thrombotic state of, as you all know about. What about iron? So before going through this, I, I have to say that most of the evidence that I found this topic, unfortunately, are weak, uh, single studies, um, like retrospective, just because the disease is, is rare and uh, unfortunately there is no much of registries. So one of the observational tri studies uh, did um, uh, like um, proposed that iron uh, infusion or administration of iron is a risk factor for calciphylaxis. That came from the fact or, or, the, observ or the observation of iron deposition in the his uh, histopathology results um, of calciphylaxis lesion. But whether this is actually a cause or a risk factor or actually a consequence like hemosiderin deposition is still not, uh, not clear. And so far, we, really can't, we cannot recommend denying these patients who are severely iron deficient from iron because we also know that iron deficiency anemia is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. What about the type of dialysis? Again, few observational single center small studies suggested that peritoneal dialysis patients are a high, higher risk of developing calciphylaxis than hemodialysis patient. And the rationale beyond it was maybe under clearance. But someone can argue that I can actually maximize the clearance and, or like by, by doing a sufficient or more frequent or, or like maximizing the clearance in the peritoneal dialysis. Um, in this single, stu single center study, they had seven patients out of their 36 peritoneal dialysis patients. Seven patients developed calciphylaxis. Five out of these seven were actually on hemodialysis, and then they got converted to peritoneal dialysis because of excess failure. So they proposed that the conversion to peritoneal dialysis made them under dialyzed and was uh, uh, like a risk factor for them to develop calciphylaxis. This is a nice study that actually talked about the risk of repeated skin trauma uh, as a, a risk factor for calciphylaxis. They, they actually tested that in three different models. They looked into the number of insulin injections that our patient gets, and they found that the higher the number of insulin injections, the higher the likelihood or, ratio or the odd ratio of de developing uh, calciphylaxis. And I think this, this study gives us a, a, like a hint that we should be uh, advocating for less insulin injections for our patients. If you have a dialysis patient who's taking the uh, insulin twice, a day, the short intermediate acting on pre-meal and correction doses, see if you can convert them to a long acting and make sure that they are, you're, they are rotating the injection inside. So the diagnosis of calciphylaxis is actually clinical. If you have a patient with a classic presentation, a classic patient, you don't need to have a skin biopsy to prove it. The uh, situation where you need skin biopsy is if you have an indifferentiated uh, lesion, like a patient with a, a, a good EGFR or normal kidney function. And remember, the skin biopsy is because they borely, um, they, they heal poorly. This study actually questioned the benefit of doing uh, skin biopsy in these patients. And so what basically they did, they compared 36 skin biopsy from patients who had, uh, or actually suspected calciphylaxis, with 37 patients who had amputation for peripheral vascular disease. And they, you can see here that both uh, pathologies, they showed almost similar pathologies in both. So they both demonstrated 
calcification, artery use, thrombosis, intimal hyperplasia, or, or combination of lesions. Although it was more prominent and more significantly prominent in the patients suspected of calciflexis, but they could not identify or a, a single finding in isolation that was diagnostic for calciflexis. Again, just emphasize on the point that if you have a classic lesion in a classic patient, you don't have to go for a skin biopsy. What about laboratory investigation? So basically, they are not helpful. We know that hyperphosphatemia, hypercalcemia, hypobara are all risk factors, but we also know that these, this is a, a data from a German registry of calciphylaxis, and they found that 86% of their patients with calciphylaxis had either normal or low calcium, and 40% of them, the other patients, they had normal or low phosphate. So don't depend on these uh, values to diagnose it, but uh, it will be helpful to see that they, they, are, they, they are a risk factor for it in order to correct it. What about imaging? So I'm sure most of us know that if you x-ray all of our patients, you will see the silver-like wire uh, of calcified vessels um, in most of our patients. So this is really non-specific, and you see it in all uh, our uh, patients with calcified uh, peripheral vascular disease. But maybe what's more specific, I'm not sure if you can see this area, uh, which looks like a lazy um, uh, calcification in the soil. Tissue. This is more, more as a specific for calcification. Oh, sorry, for calciphylaxis. Again, mammogram might sometimes be used, but it will not help you help you to differentiate the calciphylaxis from um, just a peripheral uh, vascular disease or ca vascular calcification. And the lesion can also look like a, a calcified um, lesion, like a tumor or a cancer. Actually, bone scan was actually proposed as as a more specific uh, modality because you can see the calcium uptake. In a, uh, in a non bone uh, area, like in this case, you can see that there is uptake in the medial uh, aspect of both thighs. But also keep in your mind that uh, this might give you uh, false negative results because these are ischemic ulcers. So the profusion is poor. So the dye uptake might not be um, optimal. So these lesions are uh, ulcerative, sloughed out, and you might give you it might give you a negative result. So negative result does not rule out uh, the diagnosis. The management of calciphylaxis is multidisciplinary. So you really need the, the a co cooperation or a multidisciplinary approach from different teams, dermatology, nephrology, dietitian, vein and uh, palliative, plastic, wound care, and you need more and more, I'm sure, uh, if it would, would be like infectious disease team and et cetera. And the three main pillars that on, on treatment that should go uh, together is these three, the treatment of wound and the pain, uh, strategies to promote decalcification, and strategies to stop calcifications. So I'll talk first about the pain, because the pain is the most debilitating symptom that the patient will come with. This pain is largely ischemic pain, but they can also have some neuropathic components on it. And as I said before, usually it's out of proportion of the uh, physical examination finding, and usually it's severe and refractory to opioids. So you really need the help of pain management specialist or anesthetist to give you a, a good or adequate pain uh, relief with a combination of analgesia, dissociation, and sedation. So they might need to use an uh, NMDA or GABA looking agents. And as you know, it Bain in our population, dialysis patients, is challenging because these patients can go into toxicity very easily. And also some of these medications are dialyzable, so they will not have, they will have a wear off of this drug effect post dialysis. Some investigators actually talk, thought about, or actually did uh, investigate doing even spinal analgesia in such patients with a refractory bane and local injection of uh, analgesia as well. The second uh, most important, I would say, is wound care. The goal here is to remove any oxidative necrotic tissue to prevent infection, because as I mentioned before, this is the main cause of death in such population. And again, these wounds are very complex uh, to treat because they are ischemic uh, uh, tissue and they are very poor uh, healing properties. And also they are extremely painful, so making uh, wound dressing and even wound deprivement is very difficult. And uh, the wound management really relies on moisturizing, removing 
of any dead uh, tissue and prevention of uh, and treatment of infection. Um, so, so surgical deprivement is really uh, indicated strongly in these patients to prevent infection. And um, it actually, in some studies, shows survival benefits. But again, they are all small retrospective studies. Now we'll go to strategies to stop calcification. So you need to correct uh, hypercalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. You need to use a non-calcium-based uh, phosphate binders. And you need to discontinue all the calcium, vitamin D supplements, and um, you need to avoid high calcium dialysates if you're using such in your, in your units. And you need to correct the hyperparathyroidism. Um, in this case, actually, sinicalcet is more preferred than doing a parathyroidectomy because you don't want to deal with a post parathyroidectomy hunger bone syndrome, then you have to go back to supplementation with calcium and vitamin D. So to be like a fiscal cycle. And unfortunately, we don't have an optimal BTH level for patients with calciphylaxis. Uh, as we all know, even the level for our CKD and the patient is not that optimal. We need to discontinue warfarin and find out an alternative if really anticoagulation is necessary. Uh, so every time you need to start warfarin in a patient, uh, not, not just weigh the risk and benefit of GI bleed, but also think about calciphylaxis. And if you have to use if you DUAC or LUAC, uh, or you can also use subcutaneous injection, but again, think about the risk of, uh, uh, the, uh, the, as uh, injection is a risk factor as well. So you have to also minimize repetitive injection at the same time to rotate the injection sites. What about renal replacement therapy? So uh, in patients with uh, end-stage kidney disease with calciphylaxis, studies suggested that in Intensifying their dialysis by either increasing the length or the frequency of dialysis may, may accelerate wound healing. But I think this is more, uh, more uh, applicable for someone who had abnormalities in their bone mineral. Like, for example, they're already hyperphosphatemic, hypercalcemic. They already have evidence that they are under, they, they under your hemodialysis. And, and some studies also recommended switching from uh, if they are already on pelotonic dialysis to, to hemodialysis to achieve better clearance. But it's very controversial, like in up-to-date expert opinions, uh, they do recommend to adhere with the National Kidney Foundation Kidoki guideline for, for clearance. So they don't usually intensify dialysis if you already reach your goals for, for clearance. And uh, they do increase it if they found that these patients are refractory, hypercalcemic, or hyperphosphatemic despite uh, dietary restriction and adjustment of their medication. And their opinion is to uh, that they, they do not routinely convert their patient to peritoneal dialysis unless they are failing in peritoneal dialysis. Again, it remains expert opinion, and there is no big studies to support such decisions. So nobody will blame you if you do that. In fact, this study looked into the uh, clinical characteristics and risk factors for uh, mort for mortality in calciphylaxis. One of the things that they talked about as a risk factor is aggressive hemodialysis, and they gave it an, a hazard ratio of almost three, significant hazard ratio for mortality. But I think we should interpret this in caution. We should not uh, blame directly aggressive hemodialysis uh, because we already know what we are dealing with a disease that's high mortality anyway. And usually we, we, we try to do any, every uh, modality we, we, can, we can to, um, to like, uh, improve the patient's survival if someone is already sick. Like you will throw any intervention just to make to make things get better. So uh, it, I don't think we can actually um, make a causal uh, direct causal effect from aggressive dialysis. And their definition of aggressive dialysis in this in this study was actually for five or more dialysis per week, which is quite aggressive. Let's talk about sodium thiosulfate. So this drug um, is actually used off label for. Uh, for calciphylaxis. This drug is FDA approved for the treatment of CNI toxicity. And also, actually recently, maybe last year, it got approved for the prevention of autotoxicity from cisplatin um, in, in pediatric population. But so now the, it, it's, it's used as off-label uh, uh, drug for the management of calciphylaxis. And the first successful use of it was in 2004, uh, when they used it for first uh, with successful story. And since then, it has been the standard therapy for calciphylaxis. 
So there was a few proposed mechanism of how sodium thiosulfates help improve your the lesion or um, uh, even mortality sometimes in some studies. So this um, this drug basically is a calcium chelator, so it binds to the calcium and forms a soluble component that can be excreted or eliminated either by urine or by dialysis itself. It does also have some antioxidant properties, so it will uh, neutralize the uh, free radicals uh, and uh, that can promote thrombosis and vasoconstriction. It does have a vasodilatory property, so theoretically it will improve the profusion and improve blood supply to this ischemic necrotic tissue. And also in vitro, it was uh, shown that this drug inhibits the proposed that will do the same thing uh, in human cells, so it will uh, prevent calcification. So uh, this drug is actually available in multiple forms. There is IV, oral, intraperitoneal, intralesional, but the most commonly used uh, uh, or route of, of, of administration in calciphylaxis is IV. And usually it's administered three times a week, uh, both dialysis in the last half an hour to an hour both dialysis, and for peritoneal dialysis patient, three times a week. And the dose is usually bare weight. So if your patient is above 60, you give 25 gram, and if we are below 60, you give 12.5 gram. There is no consensus of how for how long you need to treat, but most uh, observation, most studies, retrospective studies, and expert opinions that you need to treat for at least three months. And usually, if there is effect, you start to see some effect in in few weeks uh, in terms of pain and maybe lesion improvement. The duration it should be at least uh, you should continue for at least six months or until complete healing of the lesion. And there are also some cases of successful use of calciphylaxis uh, as an injection or intralesional injection together with IV. So I'll show you one case later on. And you need to be aware about the side effects. This is a, low, a big sodium load, so they can actually develop volume overload. It, as I said, it's a calcium chelator, so it will lead hypocalcemia and subsequently QT prolongation. And because it's a vasodilatory drug, it could uh, hypotension, might cause hypotension, and then it also proposed to cause a uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis. The mechanism is really not well understood, but the, the thiosulfate part get converted to sulfate in the liver, and there was a, a, a questionable cause of, of uh, acidosis because of this part. Still big, a big cause, and but it's frequently seen as a side effect. Although these side effects, you might see these side effects during the treatment, but all of, well, almost all of them is um, doable, like you can, or like you can, still can continue the treatment by adjusting the dose or slowing the infusion. But if they develop refractory volume overload, severe symptoms, arrhythmia, then um, this, is, uh, this is the time when you stop treatment. Unfortunately, till now, we don't have published randomized controlled trial for the use of thiosulfates in calciphylaxis. But if this study, for example, they use the use of sodium thiosulfate for vascular calcification, it's a double-blinded randomized control trial. Basically what they did, they randomized hemodialysis patient to receive sodium thiosulfate for six months versus a placebo for six months. The primary outcome in this trial was to look into the uh, calcification in the abdominal aorta and they used a CT scan with a special measurement of calcium score. And the secondary outcome is calcification in the peripheral vessels, iliac, uh, valves, carotids, so as you can see, there was no much difference in calcification abdominal aorta, but there was a significant, at least statistical, impro uh, significant improvement in the calcification uh, of the uh, iliac valve and carotid. And uh, you will go, th when you just search about sodium thiosulfate, you will come up with lots of uh, successful stories about using uh, sodium thiosulfate with either partial or complete resolution. But really you need to look into are they using different modalities? Is it really this, just the sodium thiosulfate? It, uh, is it because we're using lots of things at the same time? It's very difficult to tell. So like in this study, if they used both IV and intralesional lesional, uh, thiosulfate, and uh, this patient has bilateral shin, um, leg, sorry, legs uh, um, lesion in both, both legs, and they use uh, IV and intralesional. And by day 108, it was almost complete resolution.
in the lesion. But if you go back and identify the three dialysis, so it's very difficult to pinpoint is it just the disulfate or is it just a combination of all modalities. On the other hand, this systematic review and meta-analysis recently published in JAMA, actually in April this year, looked into the use of sodium thiosulfate for cataphylaxis in CKD patients. So they came up with, all, they screened almost 5,000 studies, but they ended up with 19 studies. They excluded any study with less than two patients. So any case report with a single patient was excluded. And they also, they had good uh, criteria for selection to put a target outcome. So they came up with these 19 studies. The outcome they were looking at is improvement in the skin lesion. So you can see here, some of them showed favor no sodium thiosulfate, some of them favored sodium thiosulfate, some of them actually no difference. But overall, uh, combining all the results, there was actually no difference whether you use sodium thiosulfate or not. With a good heterogeneity, and the, the, there was no much heterogeneity in the patient population in the old studies. Again, such studies, because there are very, some of them, very small number of patients, maybe one, some, some studies had a higher weights. For example, this one, they have, they have like more number of patients, bigger weights. So is it because this study, this study has more, more patients, so it shifted the result to the other, the other way? And again, when they looked into overall death and survival, same thing. There was no difference in whether you use sodium thiosulfate or not. Again, the same um, argument comes here. So what we did really is a randomized control trial looking into sodium thiosulfate versus placebo. And this study, the Calista trial, is actually coming up. I don't know when, but soon. So this is a phase three multi-center randomized double-blind placebo control trial evaluating the efficacy and the safety of the use of sodium thiosulfate for the treatment of calciflex. The primary outcome they're looking for is pain or the intensity of pain, which is subjective, but are, their secondary outcome is also the lesion and the survival. Uh, the study is co completed in May 2020, but it's still not published. So we're looking forward to see the result of this trial. And this is a case report, an interesting case of so the use of sodium thiosulfate for visceral calciphylaxis. It's a, a young lady with normal kidney function who presented with uh, painful nodules, sorry, painful nodules in her uh, breast. And with the CT scan, you can see here diffuse calcification in the breast and, uh, and the lungs. And here, what happened after five months of use of sodium thiosulfate, almost complete resolution of the calciphylaxis here and maybe some remnant in the lungs. What about vitamin K? So vitamin K is a very benign vitamin. Uh, I can't imagine any harm happens if someone took uh, uh, vitamin K, uh, unless you take it in a, a suicidal dose. But it, it has been already proven that vitamin K retired the progression of calcification in coronary arteries and aortic valve in, in, in few studies. So now there is actually an ongoing study to uh, test the use of vitamin K in calciphylaxis patients. The trial is still ongoing, and they are randomizing patients to receive vitamin K IV three times a week versus placebo. So we are again looking forward for this trial. The outcome was mainly actually looking at the carboxylated status of MBG and AB that we talked about before, but they do have also secondary outcomes of change in pain level, size of the lesion, et cetera. <clears throat> Let's talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So this is considered as a second line therapy if your uh, all your effort of removing uh, calcif medication that cause calcification, the sulfate intensifying treatment failed. Usually you go into this, and some people go directly to it, depending on how how feasible it is and uh, how bad is the lesion. Basically, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is delivering 100% oxygen at 2 to 2.5 times the atmospheric pressure, uh, usually for around 90 minutes to two hours, and basically delivers lots of oxygen into ischemic area to improve uh, oxygen delivery to such necrotic area. And there are, again, very uh, small retrospective studies that supported the use of it. Like for this, for example, this small retrospective study, 34 patients. So 58 patients of them, they showed improved Implemented their wound and more than half actually complete resolution of the wound healing. So, for, oh, sorry, of the lesion. However, 35% experienced deterioration, and two patients there was no change in the lesion. Most of them died within one year. So, regardless what you actually your effort, 
this disease is a deadly disease. You might not be able to change the outcome, but at least improve the quality of life. Again, actually, if you go back to the study and read it in detail, you will find that some that these patients who, who had better outcome and better wound healing are the ones who actually received also thi thiosulfate. So again, I think they need more um, RCT looking into each intervention separately. This is an example of a patient who received hyperbaric oxygen before and after treatment. And more studies coming. They're still in, in the way. Uh, so the beta cal -T study is uh, based in Spain, multi-center trial. It's, they're still recruiting patients, actually. And they're randomizing them to vitamin K versus magnesium citrate versus sodium pyrosulfate versus high flux dialysis. And uh, there are lots of trials ongoing diff using different modalities. People are trying to find out a novel treatment for such disease. And again, here, there are lots of people who as I said, trying to find a, a, a way of uh, that might help such a uh, disease, even like using the toxophilin, tissue plasmogen activator, apheresis, even negot therapy. Some people use it. And I can't end the presentation without talking about transplants. So here's a case report of three patients uh, who underwent urgent kidney transplantation for calciphylaxis. And guess what? The three patients had almost complete resolution of their skin lesion post-transplant. So I tell you, is there something else going on other than the calcification? Uh, or is there another toxin that we are not aware of that actually goes away with transplantation? This is a patient who, had, this is day, day two, or maybe day four post-transplant, uh, and this is day 22 post-transplant. I'm sure they also used everything as, as well, like the sodium thiosulfate and dialysis prior, uh, plus the transplant push. So let's go back to our patients. So our patient was treated with a multidisciplinary approach with multiple uh, specialties involved. So the nephrology team arranged a dialysis four times a week. In his case, not just for clearance, but he also known uh, low EF, low ejection fraction with volume, refractory volume overload. He received sodium thiosulfate for five months and he received hyperbaric oxygen therapy with the uh, help and arrangement with the Royal Hospital. Uh, he actually uh, did it only for two weeks because he couldn't tolerate it. Uh, he did have severe pulmonary hypertension, which limited the continuation of that. And his hyperbaric thyroidism was treated with sinacalcid. He had wound debridement by the urology team. He was followed by the vascular team. And actually, they even we attempt uh, angioplasty of both of his iliac arteries to just help uh, improve the perfusion to distal uh, lesion. Uh, he was also followed by the pain management team, regular barstamol, regular tramadol, amitriptyline, gabapentin, fentanyl batch. He was still in excruciating pain. He was followed daily with the daily wound nurse and uh, psychiatry team was following him for sleep disturbance and mood uh, depression. He was having a continuous angina on dialysis because of his uh, diffuse calcified vessels, and he was followed by cardiology. He he had uh, he has been followed by the infectious team guiding the antibiotics. Actually, during his his uh, during that year, he had multiple admissions with sepsis, bacteremia, candidemia, and unfortunately, he died at home in March 2023. And just to tell you, he actually presented to us in March 2022, just telling you that the survival. It actually, yes, it's, a, it's one year or less. So I'm going to end up with this, although it was difficult for me to come up with conclusion from this trial, just because of how rare is the disease, how devastating is the, uh, the end result, and lack of evidence behind everything. Um, I think early diagnosis still matters, um, and initiation of multidisciplinary approach uh, management might actually help. Um, we always should think about the prevention uh, of vascular calcification before we deal with such lesions. So think about calciphylaxis before you prescribe calcium uh, as a phosphate binder or you give warfarin for just a low-risk AFib. Um, I think we need large national and maybe international data registries. So there are two registries, one in US and one in Europe. Uh, but, uh, for example, uh, thanks to Dr. Saja, she actually collected almost 10 or 11 patients from SQH since 2011. That's almost one, one, one patient per year. And unfortunately, all of our patients died, uh, the, the 100% mortality. 
Um, so it will be really nice if we have uh, a national registry. I'm sure all of you have seen such cases, maybe more challenging cases. And it will be nice to gather all of these patients to see if there is any different characteristics we have or, or different modalities that was more successful. And of course, we need larger uh, randomized controlled trials for single interventions without bias of, uh, of um, multiple interventions. Although I would say it's difficult to do this because you don't want to, uh, to deprive your patient of an intervention that might, might help. So most of us really will throw all of the interventions on these patients to, uh, to help uh, the, the, at least their quality of life, improvement of brain and, and skin region. That's all what I have for tonight. Thank you very much. And happy to hear of